Okay. And you can look at me. You don't have to look at that. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So I want to know about. Do you want more pillows? Yeah. This is another one if you what, want it. What questions are you going to be asked? I want to ask you if you had any pets when you were growing up. Yes, I always had a dog of some kind. You didn't have cats? I don't think we ever had many cats. No, we didn't. Not on purpose? So tell me about, tell me about the first dog you had. And the first dog I had was named uh, Skillet. <laughs> we called him Skillet because he came from uh, a family up in the hills that was, um, uh, they were uh, cutting some timber. Uh -huh. And they left that little dog right side the road for some reason when they come down out of the muddy. And left that little dog side the road and for somehow... They never wanted to pick him up. Oh boy. So I picked the little dog up and kept him and called him Skillet. How old were you? I was probably what, about 10 years old or so. And how long did Skillet last? He lasted until I was in college. Really? That's a good yeah. Age. I was in college and come home uh, one day after college on a weekend and he was dead in the flower garden. <laughs> That's appropriate. Well, how about you? What kind of pets did you have as a kid? Well, I had a cat. It was actually my girlfriend's cat. Uh -huh. And she called the cat Junior because she thought she had a male. But Junior had an explosion one day and had kittens on the bed. <laughs> oh, in the house? In the house. In the boys' room. Was Not in my room, but it was in the boys' room. <laughs> As we found out, Junior was misnamed. <laughs> junior was a junior S. Yeah, she was. <laughs> she would never go back after her, her owner, Linda. Her name was Linda Chase. And after she brought her over to my house, Junior never went back to Linda's house. Wow. But she, she, cats choose where they want to live. What kind of uh, clothes did you wear back then, Mom? Uh, blue jeans. Your, since you were the only girl, did you get hand-me-downs from the boys? I would sometimes wear Alan's blue, blue pants, but I always had to take a stick and put between the belt loops to hold them because they were too big around the waist. <laughs> a very narrow waist. <laughs> did, uh, did you get, ever get a fancy dress, or did Grandma make it for you? Mother made most all of my clothing, my coats and, and hats and gloves and... She loved to sew, and she was a good sewer. But uh, when I was 12, my dad bought me a brand new dress for Christmas. It was, I remember it was navy blue, and, I was, and when I was eight, mother took my girlfriend and I, Judy Brown, and we went to Salt Lake on a bus and had dinner, and that was a big event. And we went to J.C. Penney's, and she bought us matching dresses, and that was the first dress that I remember getting when I was who my aunt took me shopping and she saw two little outfits and said do you want the blue one or the white one and I said I want both of them so she bought them both <laughs> <laughs> which aunt was that that was aunt Audrey she was 12 years younger than my mother and how uh, tell me where she fits in how, she, she was the baby in the family and that was grandma's sister uh-huh grandma my mother's sister oh. I think Dave her brother was the last I guess Audrey was not the baby I, I know when Audrey was expected and mother was 12 she didn't have a clue that there was going to be a new baby in their family and she's 12 <laughs> years old and she was sent to the neighbors because children were born at home in that area of the world at that time and so she was sent to the neighbors she didn't know why and she came back the next morning and met two ladies walking to her house and she said, well, where are you going? We've come to see your new baby sister. And she I don't have a new baby sister, but she did. That, that's where they come from. Yeah, yeah, what kind of clothes did you grow up with? I had uh, Levi's and uh, Wrangler pants. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and uh, they bought them through usually Montgomery Wards or Sears and Roebuck catalog. And did you get a new, you know, Two or three pair every year? Or well, they always got them uh, when school started. And uh, we milked cows. And so we had a little cream check to 
pay for the clothes that we bought, pants <coughs> and shirts so and stuff. So we had money that our parents had to buy our clothes. So did you earn the money to pay for your clothes or mm-hmm. did you get an allowance? Or? Yeah, the, well, I didn't have an allowance. We just, they, she just knew she had money from his cream check to buy clothes. So that's the kind of clothes okay. that we had. You usually got them about the first the start of the school year. You weren't as fussy about your clothes as mom was about her dresses? Not at all. I just glad to have some nice uh, Levi's or Wranglers or something. It was very... Oh, and sometimes we had those bibs. Yeah. Bib Pants when you was younger had the Overall. bibs. <laughs> yeah, with a little <laughs> strap or the top. But when you got a little older, you like to have a little nicer piece of clothes than that. Those bib overalls were kind of old-fashioned. Those are some of my favorite clothes. <laughs> what were some of your favorite things to eat when you were little? Do you remember growing up being your favorite foods? My favorite food was my mother's tomato soup. Mm. She, she made good tomato soup. It was just uh, noodles in them and uh, tomatoes and tomato sauce and she knew how to make it, just the right mixture, so it always tastes very good. Is that still a comfort food for you? Yes, I still like it. What was one of your favorite foods, Mom? Our mother made really good fried chicken, but in our, in our house, all the adults ate and the children ate last. And so I learned to enjoy to eat the gravy that was made off the chicken because there wasn't always any chicken left. <laughs> but uh, I, ate, I, I, would get, I liked chicken, fried chicken, really well. Pork chops is another one of my favorites. Mm. What memories do you have of things you liked to do as a kid? I like Your to... free time fun thing. Okay, I, li- I like to cut out things out of magazines and papers and old no- uh, post magazine and paste them on another piece of paper and I'd leave my little clippings laying all over my bedroom floor. And when my mother would have enough of it, she'd bring down a scoop shovel from the barn and say, we got to clean this mess up. <laughs> she'd sweep all those little tiny pieces of cut paper that was left into a scoop shovel and scoop it out of my room. It was always an embarrassment to me. <laughs> but uh, I liked to walk the fences. There were pole fences made out of uh, uh, cedar trees, and they just go straight up, and, and they get narrower as they go, and then they'd cut those down, and Dad had lots of fences around the property, and I'd try to walk all the way around that piece of property and not fall off the fence. Don't get in the hot lava on the ground. Though. That's right, because <laughs> we I was always barefoot in the summer. I, I, they bought one pair of shoes when school started, and those was I wore them for the whole school year, and then went barefoot all summer, and then we buy another pair of shoes. So, right. yeah. yeah. What, yeah, what do you remember doing as activities for fun? Did you uh, have any time for fun? Yeah. Oh, it seemed like I didn't have much time for fun. Because we were always busy having chores to do, milk cows, take care of the livestock. But uh, when I was about, oh, seven or eight years old, I bought a flexible flyer sleigh. Mm. So that was always fun to have. Uh, go sleigh riding on a flexible fire sleigh. Did it snow enough in Mount Carmel? Oh, or yeah. Did it play in the winter? Mm-hmm. Did you ever tie it up to the back of a horse? or? No. Mm-mm. We cool. had uh, made a little sleigh riding uh, track there behind the house, uh, between the house and the hill right there. Made a little sleigh riding track that you could slide down the hill and go almost out to the main highway. And then when I was a little older, I bought myself a Swin bicycle. Mm. So I, I think it probably was mm-hmm. a Swin bike, which was one of the very classic bicycles yeah. of the time. And I bought that with some of the money I would earned as a Swin you, bicycle. Where'd you earn your money? Uh, sometimes they would uh, pay us for little extra job or something we was doing Doggy on lamps. the farm. Your doggy lambs? 
Oh, yeah, we did have doggy lambs. That's right. I so forgot that's about that's the that's doggy that's lamb. That's what a doggy lamb is. Doggy lamb is uh, when they have lambing season. If the mother doesn't uh, claim, if they have twins or something, and she doesn't want to keep one of the lambs, they'd always bring it home, and we'd end up uh, feeding it uh, there at the house, and they'd be called doggy lambs because they did not have a mother. And so we had that to sell in the fall for some of those doggy lambs. If you didn't take care of it, what happened to the lamb? Would the lamb die? No, the lamb would go with all the rest of the sheep. The lambs would go market in the fall with all the other lambs of the main herds mm -hmm. would go uh, with uh, other lambs to market down in uh, uh, Salina or Richfield or somewhere down in Central Utah, they would be part of the flock that yeah. got uh, sent to the, they'd go down there and feed them for a while, and then they would butcher. Yeah. Did, when you guys were growing up, did you have heroes, uh, you know, sometimes our kids, they have heroes as athletes, or they, uh, Harry Potter, or stuff, somebody that they wanted to be like, or somebody that was a hero, or, you know, that they looked up to? Um, somebody I looked up to was, uh, uh, let's see, this, uh, guy that played basketball, uh, mm -hmm. colored guy that played basketball, what was his name, one of the first ones on television, uh, um, Bill Russell. Bill Russell, I remember him. Bill Russell, I remember when I went to college, I was so excited to, uh, see the television for the first time in college in the uh, commons room. And I saw Bill Russell actually playing basketball on television. Was that a, a unique thing to have a black man playing basketball? Oh yeah, especially him. Or watching television. Or even watching television, because I never, we never did have a television at our house. <laughs> Well, back to the sled, I got, I got to tell on Grandpa now. Last year, he got his flexible flyer sled out and sl went sleigh riding with his grandkids. The same one? The same one. And he wow. came down Green Hill on it. Up, on, up here at Alma Clark's Green, <laughs> Green Hill. I love it. Green um, Hill and... At 82, at, that yeah. was... About, <laughs> just that flexible flyer still runs pretty good. There you go. <laughs> so why was Bill Russell somebody you looked up to? Because he was uh, he was a good player, for one thing, and he never uh, told anybody how good he was. Other people told how good he was, and he was very modest and very polite and a very uh, generous man. And he was just a good player, and I admire him for being such a gentleman basketball player. Wow. I never would have guessed that one. Mom, how about you? How about a hero or somebody you looked up to? I had four older brothers, and they brought a lot of funny books into to the house. And so I would look at these war heroes, because I was born just as the war started. So I'm five or six years old, and I'm finding these funny books with G.I. Joe and all these different uh, heroes in there. And then that's where I got my opinion of what a hero was, a yeah. strong person that would fight to protect people. So you played with G.I. Joes? Well, we didn't have any G.I. Joe dolls at the time, but we did have the funny books. Funny books. So and Superman characters. and those characters were in the funny books before they became... Made into toys. Did you cut them out of your paper? Probably. <laughs> I don't know if I, I. I'd have to be a pretty beat up funny book because I'd get in trouble with oh, my yeah. brothers if I cut up their cut good up ones. Their comic books, you'd be in big trouble. I'd been big trouble. Yeah. So, is that Bill Russell? Played for the Celtics. Looks like. Yeah, so, he did play for the Celtics. So. Yeah. This is Bill Russell. Yeah, he did play for the Celtics. So, and I, that was one of my favorite teams as a Celtic for years. 
Um, now I don't watch any of them because of their attitudes. Ball. Most of them play basketball. Just watch college ball, right? Yeah, I watch some college ball, but not professional because those guys are prima donnas. I think most of them are. They are more important than anybody else is the players because they make more money than anybody else. And then so, they have to com complain about this or that. Yeah. They are, uh, they don't seem to be very concerned about even who's paying their salary. They are just very important to themselves. If I remember right, Bill Russell did make a lot of money. I don't remember anything about his salary, oh, okay. but he was just... I just liked him because he was such a gentleman Classic. playing basketball. Um, did now when you were growing up, you were growing up in the in the thirties, uh, right? Nope. Your childhood. I my forties. Forties. My fifties uh, is when I was in high school. So when you were little, I know we played army games all the time. <laughs> did you ever play army games as kids? Um, and what battles did you reenact? And what I mean, who, how did you do it? I'm just curious. Well, just cowboys and Indians, sort of silly things like that, you know, but nothing very serious. Well, down in southern well, Utah, the Indians would have been a real thing. <laughs> uh, yes, we had the Indians that worked for us. Indians, uh, Navajos that worked for us, uh, herding sheep. So. They uh, they didn't pay any attention to us playing cowboys and Indians, and uh, so but but that was just something you like to do was play cowboys and Indians. Was, you didn't have any war, World War Two. No. Wasn't battling out mm. in your childhood. No. We uh, played games. Like you we were, did. You did. At recess, we'd jump out of the swing. We'd get it going really hard, and then we'd jump out and holler, "Bums over Tokyo!" We had no idea where Tokyo was bums or what or was. Bums over Tokyo. Bombs. <laughs> we had I no idea what we were saying and what it was all about. <laughs> so you were bombing Tokyo. You were jumping off the swings. Yeah, yeah, jump out that swing. Is that because you were closer to a military base? That there was a little more military influence. Well, my husband, my husband, my dad worked at Hill Air Force Base. Right. So he he brought some friends and um, we met. I know he had an Italian man that was a POW that worked there that he brought home one weekend and visited with. And I remember he brought another man that had lost parts of both arms when the airplane started to take off off of a, a, a carrier, mm -hmm. and he threw up his arms and it cut him off. And I remember watching this man put his artificial limbs on, and so I did know a little bit about the effects of war. And I suppose that affected us all. And that's one reason one year for Christmas I got half of a boy's bicycle for my gift. <laughs> it just wasn't it just wasn't big in our family anyway. Uh, and there just wasn't a lot of building materials and, and things of that available. Mm -hmm. And so um, we lived a kind of a quiet white life on that. But we did have chores as well as as Roe did. I I remember gathering eggs and one time there was a great big rat sitting at the end of the chicken coop, great big rat. And I scared, he scared the socks off me. I ran to the house and yelled, there's a rat in the chicken house. And my brother went out with his, his 22 uh, rifle and shot and killed this big old ugly rat. But, but I would take the eggs into the house and put them behind our back and say, guess how many eggs? Mother would play the game with us. And I think that's where I learned how to count, was counting <laughs> eggs when I'd gather them up as a little as a young person. I got one, two, three, two. <laughs> <laughs> Dropped one. <laughs> what, what do you remember about your Christmases, Dad? Some of them pretty meager as well. Yeah, no, we had a nice Christmas tree in the living room. And we'd all meet around the Christmas tree. And I remember my grandmother, Sorensen, was always around our house. My mother took care of my grandmother, Sorensen, for many, ma for many years. Remind me her name. Uh, Marinda. Mm -hmm. She's the one that had the big uh, gold on her neck. Yeah. Okay. But she lived in our in our house about as long as I can remember. When did she die? Do you remember what year? She died when I was in the military. Yeah. Uh, 
61 or 62. Did both of them, my both grandmothers died when I was in the military. After Anita was born. Yeah. So she would have been how old when she died? You have to pull up your phone and check. Probably 60, 50, 60. Oh, she seemed older than that. I don't know. She was in, she remembered living the order. She was 12 when the order broke up. You know, my grandma had a goiter also. I can't remember. What was it that causes that? Lack of iodine. Yeah. So now they put iodine in salt. Table salt always has iodine in it. And you should buy that because it's a, <laughs> in this climate area, it's an easy thing to get lacking in. Mm -hmm. So well, did, uh, yeah. I want to ask about Christmas. Yeah. So who, who started the orange and the sock for Christmas? Did you have those, Dad, mm -hmm. or did Mom? Yes. Or you both did? Yeah, we, we did. Had, had an orange in the we sock. We had oranges in the stocking. And a candy cane in the yeah. sock. Oh, yeah, and a candy and cane. And some candy sometimes. Mm -hmm. And you had your little sock. And the little identified. candies that were not wrapped and they'd stick to your sock and you had to peel them out. <laughs> what do you remember about your first Christmas as a married couple? That was easy. We were out in the sheep wagon. <laughs> oh, that's right, yeah. <laughs> so you really got to celebrate the... The shepherds, shepherds in the birthday. fields. <laughs> what was that like, that Christmas? It was kind of interesting. I'd never been in a sheep wagon before. And I had on a white sweater and a little white uh, um, two, two sweater set. And my father-in-law looked at me and he said, if you treasure that, you won't wear it to the sheep wagon. So <laughs> I, I changed clothes before I went. But you take your own sheets, and depending on how cold it was, that's how far down in the wool blankets you <laughs> went before you laid your sheets down. Mm -hmm. And uh, but our brother-in-law went with us, and he slept under the stove under the sheep wagon. He had bales of straw all the way around the edges so the wind wouldn't blow in. We were out on the desert, and that let Garn come in and spend Christmas with his wife and little boy. Because you went out. Because we went out and took his place. So we spent a week out the sheep this wagon. Before Anita? Uh-huh. That was our first Christmas. We were married in October, and so that was the anyway. first. That was December. So yeah. we've been. You know, we're just so what did you do to celebrate Christmas that year? Do you remember? I just. No, I don't remember. I, I, don't. I don't think we celebrated much. <laughs> just did whatever yeah. was yeah. had to be done. Yeah, and I, I I learned to cook on a coal and wood stove in the wagon, and I've learned that they don't rinse their dishes; they just wash them off and dry them. <laughs> You gotta rinse the soap off. No, no, too much trouble. <laughs> when, when you when you think of holidays growing up, or even as as parents, is there one that stands out um, of any holiday that stands out as more meaningful to you than than any other holiday? As you look back, some one that stands out that's that was very memorable to you. Uh, Christmas always did. Yeah. For me, because we uh, always had, well, not this house, Christmas in, well, what Christmas are I talking about, I guess? Mm -hmm. We had Christmas in several houses around, so Christmas any time was pretty special because we, all the kids would be there, and we'd dress up and do a little imitation of the Mother Joseph, Mother and Mary and Joseph, the little baby, and do it two or three times so everybody kind of got a chance. Did you do that as Be a child, too? Uh, yes, we did. Yeah. I love you had these traditions and you took them into your berries. Or? Yeah. And all, of, and all of our kids carry on that yeah. tradition. That's awesome. Yeah. We didn't do anything like that, but I remember one Christmas when my older brothers said, well, Linda, you and Joe have got to go up to the barn and do chores this morning because... There's animals up there that haven't been fed. It was Christmas morning. And I thought, how come we have to do it? You guys are all here. Why don't you go do it? You know? I didn't dare say it, but I thought it. And so finally we said, okay, we'll go up to the barn. But they all followed us up to the barn. Uh, were they going to make sure we feed them right or what? And uh, they, they had bought, the older brothers had bought a, a six-foot-long sled. And that was for us. And so that they they, brother, they had done the chores, but they all followed because they wanted to see the look on our faces. And I guess Joe and I would just <laughs> fell in love with that sled right off. How, how old do you think you were? Oh, maybe eight. Yeah. 
big enough to be uh, smart but cool alley. enough that it was the big brothers that bought it for you. Big brothers bought it. Wow. That was that was pretty exciting. And then my young my older brother Alan taught two Dalmatian dogs to pull it, and he had her fixed up <laughs> harnesses on it. And so when the deer were coming out of the mountains and were hungry, my dad was a helper, of, and they thought feeding them hay would help, but they learned otherwise. But anyway, Alan would put two bales of hay on that sled, and then us on top of it, and then he'd sit up on the front of it and drive the dogs, and we'd go out into the field and feed drop the deer, huh? feed the hay. Yeah, and that, that was so fun to ride on that sled. <laughs> and then well, we used well, it for you guys years. Had Christmas. Did uh, other relatives come by? Are you talking about his children? I mean, yeah. Okay. You no. have a, lot of, a house full? We or didn't have any relatives there, That yeah. just the brothers and us, our family. As they yes. grew they up and married. They, in the Midwest. Right? Yeah, they all lived in, in uh, well, we always had extras living in the house with us, but we didn't have, I never was, I, I saw my grandma, one of them once, when I was about six, and we went to Nebraska and saw her. I never saw her husband. He had passed away. And I never saw my Grandma Adams ever. She died when my dad and mother just got married. She died before she was 50. So you she had a real your, bad heart. So you met your mother's mother once yeah. in Nebraska. What was that like? All I can remember, and I was five, was seeing this very stately lady in a suit walking up. It wasn't a real mountain. It was just this little bit of a hill. And my mother said, yeah, that was my mom. And I could just remember her walking up that little hill. And that's <laughs> What's her name? Sarah. Sarah. Um, gosh. De yeah, she was a dope. She had been a uh, Clark. She was a Sarah Clark Elp. Yeah, and... Uh, a very religious lady and went to church regularly and stuff and, uh, but we didn't we didn't have church in our life until I was 13 and joined but she did church. but her daughter didn't interesting yeah she was baptized when she was two or something like that sprinkled I guess mm -hmm. but um, Deb when you did your holidays did you have family come by or was family no. already all there it's uh just our own, our own family was all, and Grandma uh -huh. was always there. But people didn't come that lived nearby? Aunts no. And mm -mm. Mm -hmm. no. He had a lot of them. We <laughs> had, uh, our Christmas was pretty private. Yeah. Did you go Just visit our, later? Yeah, after, uh, after, after you opened your presents, then you could go visit. Oh, then you would go visit. Yeah. But not as a gang, you just go visit a cousin. Yeah, cousins around the ta or town. We'll show what you got. What relatives do you remember that lived nearby you? My grandma Aspen lived in Orderville, mm -hmm. and I had a couple of uncles that lived up there in Orderville with her. And uh, oh, and I had a good friend that lived uh, close by in Mount Carmel. We'd go visit him. He was just up the street, Lawrence Reese. He, uh, we'd go visit him and uh, some of your other friends that you knew in school. You'd go okay. visit them in Mount Carmel. Did you ever get in trouble as a kid? <laughs> uh, get in trouble as a kid. <sighs> mm -hmm. Or teenager. <laughs> yes. Anything you can a, share? A serious, <laughs> a serious accident with this uh, Lawrence Reese boy. How old? He was probably 12, 13 years old, and I was about the same. We was uh, riding on the tractor up in the muddy, and he was standing on the back of the tractor, just kind of leaning up against the fender of the tractor as we were driving uh, back out of the muddy. And uh, as we were driving down the road, he fell off of that tractor frontwards, uh, so he fell under the tire, the big, the big tire uh, on the back of the tractor, and it ran over him, and it bounced up in the air, and so I stopped, went back and picked him up and put him on the tractor and took him down to the house, which was only about half a mile away from 
where he fell off the tractor. And uh, my mother took him to Kanab to the hospital right away. And uh, my mother said to me, you ought to probably go down to your bedroom and pray because he looks like he is pretty seriously wounded. And, uh, but he, he could, I think he laid down the back seat of the car, but, uh, 20 miles? It was about 15 miles to Kanab to the hospital. And he was over there for quite a while recovering, but he did make it. He did survive. But wow. somehow after that, our relationship somehow was never the same up to, uh, with his folks for some reason. And my brother said, I think why it was never, never the same is because the dad of Lawrence Reese, he wanted to uh, sue the insurance company for quite a bit of money for damages to, uh, you know, because to pay for the, that boy's uh, recovery, which uh, my dad paid anyway, the hospital bills and everything. Your dad paid but, it? Yeah. But he didn't pay any, uh, what, liabilities, mm -hmm. in which uh, uh, the, the dad wanted some liability insurance other than just Pain and insurance. Pain whatever they call it. But, uh, yeah. They never had any income. I don't know how they... I think he was on welfare of some kind because he didn't have a lot of work to do. The, the father of the Lawrence Reese. Was he not capable or he just... No, he was uh, crippled of some kind, so he didn't... He cut posts. I don't see the posts and things like that. He cut posts, so the cell for uh, uh, the kids, the young kids would go help him cut cedar posts, mm -hmm. and they would sell that to have a little extra money. But I think that, I'm pretty sure they lived on some kind of welfare, right. government welfare. So when but, that... But the one, one other thing that I learned later, the reason he didn't get liability, any liability insurance payment, was because his mother, Lawrence Reese's mother, would not allow him to do it. She was very, very, what? She was very, very friendly and happy to have us as neighbors. Right. And uh, my dad uh, hired quite a few people around to work on the farm and on the ranch. And she knew that my dad was very generous. So somehow Mrs. Reese refused to let her husband file for damages other than just to pay the expenses to get the doctor bill paid. Wow. And I thought that was pretty neat, but somehow our relationship between me and going up to his house okay. was never quite the same. Did, so that, did that sober you up as a child? I mean, did you need it much sobering up as a child? Yes, it did. Mm. How did that sober you up? <laughs> Well, I bet you went down and prayed. Oh, yeah, I, I certainly did. And uh, I don't remember. I might not even be a 10. I was just learning how to drive that tractor. Yeah. So... Were yeah. you at fault in any way? Well, I didn't think I was because he was... We we had kids stand on the back of the tractor like that all the time, riding with us it like that. It just an accident. So he just slipped off the front and slipped down and fell off in front of the tire. And I don't think, you know, I've, we've had people ride on that tractor like that lots of times. Mm -hmm. And they never As had a teenager a, uh, or an adult, did it, he never talked about it or? Really yeah, he would, it didn't seem to bother him as much as it did the parents. Mm -hmm. They, uh, they thought it was, should have been, probably some payment, other than the mother. Yeah. Susie, I think Susie was the mother's name. And the dad's name was John. And she was so kind to 
just keep it to herself and she thought the hospital bill is probably sufficient wow. and so that's how we let it go and me and Lawrence somehow were never quite the same friends because of the parents. But he, Lawrence is still alive and mm. you guys talk every once in a while? On the phone, yeah. He was he, on the car with you. Anyway. <laughs> he, he lives in Kanab. Well, I hope your mom came home and gave you a big hug. That was, <laughs> that was not be your really fault. Hard. Yeah. It was scary. scary. Very that scary. was... Mom, how about you? Did uh, growing up, did you cause any mischief at all, or were you just? Oh, I was an angel. <laughs> an angel and, and you always had brothers to point the finger at. I had a fierce temper. I was. I had a fierce temper, and when they gave me a bad time, I took it out on them. I threw things at them. I hit them over the head with a pile of dishes, especially my youngest brother. I threw a knife at him one time and it stuck in the door. So it was a terrible temper. <laughs> and I'm the one that suffered for it. How's I would that? break out in a rash. My face would have red dots on it for three days after I, I threw a fit. One time I threw a, a, we call them billiard balls, but they were little hard croquet balls. And it went through the window and through a screen and landed in the middle of the front yard. So I had a pretty good arm. Did but you ever get it under control? I did. Yeah. Did she ever get it under control? Uh, I don't think Pretty Anita much, thinks yes. I did because I no. lost it once with her when she was 18. <laughs> I, I hope she is. I so you okay, been okay, wait, there's a story here. I gotta hear this. What was the story when you I lost it? I don't remember the whole details of it, but I just remember standing outside the car and say, You are not leaving. You need to come in the house right now. And finally, after I yelled at her for 10 minutes, she acquiesced and came in the house. I'm so glad you did. I have no memory, no memory of, of it. Oh, that's good. No, that temper, my mother said to me one time, Linda, you have a pretty bad temper, don't you? And I said, yes, I do. And I don't know why. And she said, well, I had a really bad temper, oh, too. So she and so she relate. said, <laughs> yeah, she said one time my dad said, Vilma, you have a really hard, oh, he called her Bill. Bill, you've got a really bad temper, don't you? And she said, yes, Dad, I do. And he said, well, so did I. But I outgrew it, and you will too. And so she said, Linda, I'll just tell you what my dad told me. I outgrew it, and you will too. So Velma's dad said Dave, that to her. Dave, And he called her Bill. He called her Bill. He called all of his daughters a boy's name because he wanted a boy. <laughs> he didn't get it until the seventh child was born, and he finally got his boy. They named him Dave. But all well, the girls had boy nicknames. Well, Nina, why don't you think of one more question to ask? And uh, oh. it's been a very good recording. So if you look back at your childhood and, and your growing up time, what would you characterize your childhood as? Uh, peaceful, happy, idyllic? How, what are your feelings of your, of your growing up? Mine was mostly peaceful, really. Even though I had that t temper that I had to learn to live with until I outgrew it and grew up beyond it. It was, uh, was, an, it was kind of interesting in that I was one, we were one of two families that were not LDS in the whole little town of Centerville. The, us and the Hansons, that was it. And so it, in some ways it was lonely because you don't have that connection with people your own age. <clears throat> 50 years after I got out of elementary school, we had an elementary school reunion and in connection with a high school reunion. And I remember Alice Tingy said, you know, Linda, I always wanted to come play with you at your house, but my folks would never let me. And I thought, thought yeah, they, they, they knew I had older brothers. And they didn't know what kind of playing would be going on at my house because they'd never been there. And I thought, that connection was never there. So it was, it was kind of an isolating situation. But <laughs> uh, so I, you started reaching out uh -huh. and had friends that pulled you in. Yeah. In your more teenage years. Yeah, well, yeah, I was 13, just about 13 when yeah. I joined the church. But I came, started going to primary when I was 10 and graduated from primary, went to the bishop's house and quoted as many as the 13 articles of faith as I could remember because in those days you had to say them all. 
And so I, I couldn't say them all, but I, I, and I was so nervous. And I went by myself. I, I was a brave little kid. So did that start to fill that need of loneliness? I, it, it, it was just the way it was. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, no, when I was nine, I started babysitting for my brothers. And they would leave me with tiny infants and be gone all night, maybe all weekend. Nine years old, I was a babysitter for the family, so I didn't have too much time to be too lonely. <laughs> and I learned how to take care of children. Yeah. And then mother would tell me what to do, and they'd say, well, if you get in trouble, just call mom. Well, great, she doesn't have a car. She didn't, couldn't drive, what if she did? <laughs> or she shouldn't be, because she never would get her license. So, but I, could, I dared get on the ponies and the horses and ride all along the foothills by myself, or when I got in high school, I had one girlfriend that would like to come over about 5 o'clock in the morning from Red Cross, and she'd walk over, and we'd ride, and we were free. Mm -hmm. I, think I, I think freedom, and we, we wouldn't let little kids wander the streets and, and, and the fields and the hills like I was able to do back in those days. Yeah. I would go down to, <laughs> yeah, I'd go down to the pasture and... And just sit in a tree and, and dream and plan and think. And, and uh, I, I think there was a lot of freedom that, uh, that I had. Because they didn't haul you off to a lot of the shows and things? That was optional? That got, no, no. I went to the horse shows on the weekends with them. I, and I, one, one time they left us and I, I, my oldest brother, Myron, was going to take care of us. And he was 17. <laughs> and so he played Inner Sanctum. In the shadow and all the all these scary radio shows, and then he sent us to bed. But when mother and dad got home around midnight, all the lights in that great big house was on. <laughs> scared himself so bad. We didn't get scared. We couldn't understand or know what most of them were about. But rarely did we have a babysitter. Uh, there was always somebody, an adult, living in the house with us. We had Christy lived with us for a while, and Aunt Audrey lived with us for a while. Mom's sister that was dying of bone cancer. Well, that was later. That was after I got out of high school. But uh, Mother had a sister that was dying, and she lived in the little cottage right there at the side of the house that had been a carriage house made into a tiny little college cottage for her and her husband. So there was always adults around to watch over us and stuff. But, uh, the fire that burned down the barns was a scary experience. So there were some scary experiences that came in life. I fell out of a car truck when it was moving down the road and <laughs> was knocked unconscious for a little while. And, and uh, <laughs> so things happen that are kind of scary. She fell out of her car seat. That's what she did. No car seat. <laughs> fell out of her car seat. Forgot to buckle the seat belt. Actually, there was a blanket in the window of the truck, and <laughs> it was broken out. And I don't think they got the door shut. Oh, my gosh. What our kids would think if did that. Isn't that amazing? But overall, I love, it sounds like free, even though lonely at times, mm -hmm. but free and... I love that you looked around and saw a need and then reached out and found a church that could help fill some of that need. Absolutely. I, love your story. I, I saw what my older brother that was five years older than me was going through, and I thought, I don't want to go down that path. Yeah. No way. He's making some choices that are going to make his life hard. And it did. It made his hard life hard. He had a hard life. But... In his own way, he was pretty good to me, really. All the guys were. The older ones were better because they're quite a bit older. The oldest brother was 17 when he graduated from high school, and he went right into the Navy and went to Guam. And, and so he was 13 years older than I am, so I hardly remember him living at home. But uh, when they did come back from the military and got married and had kids, I was very handy because I was a baby, <laughs> free babysitter. <laughs> Uh-huh. Yeah, he was the right age. Yeah. yeah. How about you, Dad? When you look back at your childhood, what would it kind of be like? Uh, my childhood was uh, very peaceful, and I always had uh, plenty of jobs to do, and I learned how to be responsible for some of the jobs that was my responsibility, to either to... Uh, be involved in uh, milking some of the cows or being responsible for some of those lambs, I was responsible for. 
for getting the milk from the cows and taking it over to fill the bottles for those doggy lambs. And I was responsible for them up to a certain age. Mm -hmm. I felt like it was my job to make sure I did most everything correctly because I didn't have any adults around to make sure that it was done correctly. I had to do it correctly myself. Because your siblings that are just old, then you were off with Grandpa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For the most part. Yeah. So, uh, later on, some of the little Max and Shauna started feeding the doggy lambs about the time I was uh, leaving and going off to college. But most of the time, uh, I was feeding them doggy lambs either by myself or I maybe had a Mexican who was helping me quite a bit feeding those doggy lambs. So. And I, I always, uh, f f being in charge, I was in charge of the farming when I was pretty young. And, uh, like what age are you thinking? Well, when, I was big, when, I, when I was big enough to drive, to learn how to like drive the tractor, 10 and 11 and 12, I had to learn how to be kind of responsible for the water. And of course I had some guy teach me how to irrigate before that. But then after a while, I was responsible for hire, some hired hands to take care of the water and to do some other things. But I was responsible for planting the grain and irrigating and taking care of several streams of water. And uh, seeing that harvesting was accomplished at the right time. And, man, it seemed like I had a lot of responsibility at pretty young. Did you have a, did, were you pretty close to your mom? Yes, very much so. I, I knew your mother very little. I mean, just what I got to meet of her a few times, and I loved her. But what can you teach me about your mom? What was she like, and why was she special to you? My mother was, uh, what? So even tempered, I don't remember her ever uh, being angry and scolding anybody or getting, uh, you know, out of patience to be uh, so that she would be hollering at anybody. I never heard her around the table of ever being uh, angry. I just can't believe how patient she was with some of us kids mm -hmm. of uh, being uh, that way with you know she had plenty of reason to be angry at different times and I remember she always when we come home from school she always had something really really good in the house for us when we got off the bus probably some baked rolls or something or something that you really look forward to, to, uh, what, to be, be glad to be home. <laughs> I, I, I have a lot of questions. The, I've heard that women are attracted to men many times because of what they see in the man's mother. And so I guess I'm asking you, Mom, <clears throat> Was there, what, is there anything of Grandma Esplin that continues through Dad today, and what is that? In her that continues what? Through Dad today. How do you see Grandma continuing to live through Dad today? What do you see in him? <laughs> very Good. competent. Good luck. Very, very competent. Uh, and very strong, not only physically but mentally, and almost to the point of of overdoing it in a way. And I think that's been hard for him because he is so very strong, very smart. Grandma was a teacher. Did you know she taught school for a couple of years? And uh, she knew a lot about working with children and immature people and helping them in, in uh, I think Rose has been kind of looking for his mom all, with all these many 
60 <laughs> years we've been together. You didn't mm -hmm. find her in me, I'm sorry. But I see a lot of her in him. Well, I see I her do. in you. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I see a lot of her in you. I remember her singing, humming. Oh, my gosh, yes. Yes. She, yeah. When she woke up in the morning, she turned her happy tunes on. She did. Oh, my gosh, if I could tell you how many mornings I've woken up. Good morning. Good morning. Did you it's sing such that? A lovely day. Good morning. Yeah. Good I, I, morning I, to you. I know you. most of the show tune because of the morning. <laughs> and we used to listen to the radio, and there was the guy that marched around the breakfast table singing good morning like that. <laughs> and that, that. She was always positive. I always had a song in her heart, and you heard it because she loved yeah. it. Yeah, she did. She was, uh, she just constantly was humming, wasn't she? And, and she'd take her kids and go out and live in a, a house that had nothing in it. No furniture, no water. Oh, yeah. She carried her water with them, and they, it was a dry camp, but it was had a house there. And they'd live there all summer, so she could that's be out. That's familiar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's what you did. Well, yeah. sort of, but not for a whole summer. <laughs> 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 but well, she raised very competent children. She, yeah. she instilled in them what she loved and and appreciated. And she, she taught me how to be a visiting teacher. She taught me how, how to step out of my safety zone and and reach out to people that needed a teacher to come and and share time with them. And I learned. I did learn a lot yeah, from her. I remember going to church with her. She loved to sing. Yeah. She loved church. She did. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she uh, made sure if we was ever around, we went to church. And somehow, if my dad was around sometimes, especially in the summertime, <laughs> he made sure we was out doing something else on yeah, Sunday. Working. <laughs> For some reason, I don't know why. That's uh, right could, up there in those questions. You're I gonna could ask never quite figure out. Yeah. 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 Why he uh, would do something to uh, seem like it was intentionally mm -hmm. opposite of what my mother would want to happen for us. You're gonna find kids. that out. Something hurt him somewhere down the road, and, and it'll all be clear right up there with who shot JFK. We're gonna find <laughs> those questions out in the next life. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Roe, Ro he, he left out a little part that I I see is really significant. He felt so responsible for that farm and taking good care of it that after he was 12, he never finished a school year out. He was out in the fields. And, and like he said, he had to go line up men to come and help. He had to learn how to, no, but nobody taught him except people that he find, would find it. How do I, how do I irrigate? How do I plant? How, what do I do? Uh, Grandpa was always with the sheep and the cattle and the big guys. Yeah. And then the little guys, and he, but you know, we we just do the best we can when we're and, just, you, and you saw that all that work you were putting in wasn't going to come down to you, or that that was going to go to your older brothers. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. And so you realized, rightly so, right. Your bucket of under the rainbow is somewhere else. And we bless yeah. you for your courage <laughs> of trying something new. Well, Not that we wouldn't want to have grown up there, but bless you. <laughs> is, is there anything else you want to add before we wrap this one up? Yeah, to uh, learn how to farm, I remember running equipment. I remember the, one of the hardest things I learned to do was make straight corrugates for, say, your grain. Straight what? Right. Corrugates, furrows. To water, what? Corrugates. Yeah, corrugates. It's like a rope. To put uh, a water. Corrugated metal. Yeah, yeah. There's a little ditch. Yeah. It's a little ditch. So you water the grain down a corrugate. How did you make them straight? You don't well, you'd go down them. one way, and then you'd come back the other way, and you hope you stayed the right distance. You know, right. from the last time you went down, or coming back, that you stayed the right distance. To make the next one as straight as the last one you made. No so, lasers. <laughs> so sometimes when I was first learning, the corrugates <laughs> were close to the road where everybody would drive by and look at my first corrugates <laughs> from the road. Uh 
<laughs> and they were not too straight. <laughs> they kind of wobbled all over the place up through the field. Mm -hmm. And so I had, you can't change them once you make a corrugate, it's permanent. So, for the whole uh, season. Lesson there, isn't there? For the whole season. <laughs> so uh, I got to look at those crooked corrugates all summer long. And so did everybody else that drove up the highway right there by my white house. <laughs> That's where I corrugated the field, was right next to the white house, just uh, south of that house. <laughs> and that was not too great of an example of my learning how to corrugate <laughs> on a, with a tractor. Yeah. Do, do you but, remember? but I learned, I learned how to do it correctly after a while. And, uh, so, so what did I, you do to make them straight? Pay more attention to, to try and, if you made a little uh, ding in the going up, you tried to correct it coming back instead of trying to follow the, 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 the ding house. that you made. In the last one, try to make to see if you can straighten the, the, the last one. Do you remember the conference talk about the man in making rows? He talks about that experience. Do you remember it? No. So as a kid, like you, he knew he had to make them straight. So he picked an object out there, and he was going to follow it. And after a while, he realized he was following a cow. <laughs> and it didn't work. The next time he went back, he picked a fixed point that would not move. Isn't that what you that did? That was the lesson he learned. You find something that's fixed and immovable, that is strong, consistent, and true. Yeah, I, I did the same thing. I would try try to pick a cedar post yep, there you go. at the end of the field. Well, the first row was fairly straight. But somehow something happened <laughs> from there on. They got crooked because bumps, you, didn't, bumps. you didn't look at the post anymore. Yeah. You were trying to follow where you went the first time. Right. And so they didn't always stay too straight for some reason. <laughs> I love your story. <laughs> Thank you for uh, taking the time to do this. Oh. This is precious. And let me just turn this off and verify we got everything. Next time.